Once upon a time, there were two brothers called P and Q. Waltzed and cribbed in their nurseries, they were given typing lessons by famous pundits. Once their typing skills had been deemed adequately presentable, their guardians entered them into typing competitions. In the first year of competing, Q, the elder of the two brothers, demonstrated greater speed and accuracy than P, the younger one. But eventually P not only caught up with Q, but outmatched him by far. P thus began to emerge as a typing prodigy of sorts. Unable to keep up with his younger brother, Q lost interest in typing books that others had written and decided to write one himself. to give vent to the unresty stirrings of his prolific imagination. Accordingly, his typing speed stagnated, and much to the grief of his guardians, he took up literature instead of pursuing the vocation for which they'd so assiduously prepared him. Hugh's typing speed throttled down to a sluggish 20 words per minute. soared to a staggering 200 plus. With perfect accuracy into the bargain. By age 11, P was called upon to drum for the crown in sprucey typing tournaments against seasoned professionals. By the time Brother Q had reached a marriageable age, he had transmogrified from a zit-complected hobbledehoy to a brooding melancholic with furrows of care etched in his brow. Notwithstanding the grim hardships he'd lumped in his wayward quest for beauty, he adopted a strict habit of writing three sentences per day.
Uninformed affiliates of the local stats council mistook the speed of his writing for that of his typing. Wherefore, unbeknownst to Q, he became the jesting stock of his social circle. <laughs> Brother P, on the other hand, won the National Book Typing Award by the time he was 20, and thence after became a finalist for the Nitwitzer Prize. From then about <laughs> onward, he was a man of note, off being invited to act as a stand-in on late-night television. Brother Q, however, after years of struggling to attain the highest peak of perfection in his art, at long last put the finishing touches on his labor of love. A 1,200-page cloth-bound tome he regarded as his magnum opus. Casters, naturally, could not help but compare his book to the thousands of pot boilers authored by others that his brother had already typed. Consequently, they damned Q's novel with faint praise. One reviewer commentated, quote, that while the estranged brother of the estimable Mr. P may indeed demonstrate a marginal facility apropos of his implementation of the typewriter, in preparation of this undoubtedly dense, if not unwieldy, manuscript, he is eminently unpossessed of the stuff that's needed, i.e., a certain je ne sais quoi, to be taken even semi-seriously by some of the shadier, that is to say, victimizable, functionaries of the go-go typeset. Overmore, Mr. Q's so-called oeuvre, boasting but a single title to its credit, in contradistinction to the oodles of opuses attributed to the, to the superior typesmanship of his cosmically gifted younger brother, is grievously thin and in no respect devoid of some of the more rococo typographical errors this reviewer has had the misluck of blundering on in his otherwise immensely more edifying pursuits." Unquote. effort to establish his ten-upmanship over his brother's dangerously ambitious undertaking, P performed a public typing of Q's novel that was favored with round-the-clock coverage in all the leading networks. At a neck-breaking speed of 500 words per minute, he typed all 300,000 words of Q's novel in a 10-hour marathon. This was the swelling volume of lavishly measured prose that had taken Q over three quinquenniums to complete. As a coup de grace to this invidious act of nose-thumbing, P 
piece set the fresh typed facsimile ablaze with a lucifer, allowing it to combust from its prome to its appendix until all 1,200 pages were lividly aflame. In less than two blinks, this ghastly effigy of Q's bellatristic endeavor was reduced to a smoldering heap of ash on the proscenium floor. After a moment of silence so thick you could mince it with a machete, the audience broke into a flying ovation, demanding hundreds of curtain calls that lasted through the night. The most eminent momes of the day were unanimous in their praise of P's execution of the manuscript, thunderously acclaiming his one-man show as a dazzling feat of virtuosity, a slashing tour de force, a death-defying act of bravado, etc. By week's end, P was awarded the Presidential Medal of Immunity. Brother Q, soul-sick and sorrow-beaten beyond redemption, did a Brody from the helipad of a skyscraper in Des Moines. Some fifty years subsequent to his untimely solitaire, his moldy and moth-eaten lucubration was unearthed by Scholarticals and published in a limited collector's edition that targeted an audience of pack rats, curiosos, and magpieing connoisseurs of pearly cues, quizities, and other miscellaneous anomalies, whereupon some of the more sensationalistic, i.e. blood and thunder and or smoking room elements from the narrative structure of Q's text were readily adapted for a B-flick which, by some unforeseen, if not outly insane, fluke, became a Hollywood box office extravaganza. Suffice it to slay, so to speak, the producers not only killed Q's novel, but made a killing on it to boot. When Brother P reached the autumn of his days, he was bepestered by a chronic case of carpal tunnel. So ingoing was the extent to which the morbus impaired the sproil of his prestidigitations at the keyboard that poor little P was left with no choice but to give up all hope of ever tapping the keys of a typer again. His years of loneful senectitude were given over to washing down his meek regrets with copious sucks of absinthe in the halfway houses of Fort Lauderdale. His melancholy triumphs, his vacuous victories, his imaginary conquests were roundly forgotten, not just by card-carrying members of his own generation, but by those as yet unbegotten. In a pseudo-operatic, albeit feeble, 
and convulsively clumsy effort to come to terms with the inexpiable guilt he felt in connection with his brother's murder, catalyzed, it would seem, by his own jocular exploits at Q's ultimate expense, P drifted into an irreversible stupor of catatonic proportions and languished thuswise until his moldering relics were found one vesper, many moons anon, in the fly-infested garret of a flop house in Fresno, long after he'd gone bluey. sweetish odor that tipped her off that something was askew, exponed the distrait housefrau who'd inadvertingly happed upon his stuffed-up bloat. Well, I'll be, she squalled, shaking her wig with displeasure at the unsightly muck she had to scour. Can you feature that? (laughs) 